Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask our guests here in-house to make the courtesy check your cell phones have been silenced. It's always appreciated. We, of course, will post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentation, and our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Opening our discussion today and introducing our author is Al Regnery. Mr. Regnery is chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. He previously served as president and publisher of Regnery Publishing. He has also served as the publisher of the American Spectator Journal. He is also a member and former trustee of the Philadelphia Society. During the Reagan administration, he held appointments at the Department of Justice. He has also served as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and has practiced law in both Washington and the Midwest. Please join me in welcoming our good friend, Al Regnery. Al? Thank you um, very much. I am very pleased to be able to introduce my old friend, Lee Edwards, today. Lee and I first met I believe in 1965. We were both working at Young Americans for Freedom about two or three blocks from here, and it was a tumultuous time to say the least. Um, conservatism was not nearly what it is today. If the Heritage Foundation had a meeting like this, there were, might be three or four people that showed up, and Lee and I would be two of them. So um, <laughs> there you go. And in fact, our fathers knew each other before that. Lee's father was a, uh, was a reporter, columnist for the Chicago Tribune, and um, Having grown up in Chicago, my father, who was, of course, in the book publishing business, knew, I think, everybody at the Tribune, and so they certainly knew each other, too. Um, Lee has written 25 books and counting. Um, it's, you always, whenever you talk to Lee, you have to ask him, what's the current number? And then it's usually higher than you thought. Um, all about American politics and about the conservative movement one way or another. Um, and he's here today to talk about a new edition of his book on Barry Goldwater. Um, I was president of Reagan Republishing when it was published 20 years ago. And um, it was, as books go, an easy book to publish because you didn't have to fight with the author. Um, he turned it in on time. He agreed with the edits. Um, and he was certainly always very pleasant to work with, as opposed to some of the authors that we had. Um, I can say that when a biography of a politician, of a former senator, is republished after 20 years, it says something about the subject, it says something about the author, and it says something about the quality of the book. Um, most of those senators are forgotten people, and if there were books written about them or by them, they are collecting dust somewhere. But Lee's book on Barry Goldwater um, is the standard classic biography of one of the standard classic American conservatism, conservatives. Um, Lee will tell you a lot about Barry Goldwater, I'm sure, today. Um, <clears throat> he was, um, I like to say, the person that turned the conservative movement from an intellectual exercise into a political one um, in his attempt in 1960 to, or his, his, the, the campaign to make him vice president, and then in 1964, his campaign for president, his book, um, as Lee will tell you, The Conscience of a Conservative, um, 120 pages of taking what had been written over the last 20 years and condensing it into um, a very credible and understandable argument of the different parts of the conservative movement that sold 4 million copies um, during the course of its life and probably changed more minds than I would say probably any other political book in American history. Um, and Lee, again, talks about that and other things in the book. Um, it's a great story. Lee and I um, worked together last summer to put together a dinner um, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Goldwater campaign. Many of you were there. I see Randy Teague here. He was on the committee that helped us put it together. And it was a great success. Um, both of Barry Goldwater's sons, Mike and Barry Jr., were there. Um, the stories, of course, about Barry Goldwater go on and on, and some of them are some uh, very funny. Um, some of them can't be recounted in polite company, but um, nevertheless, they were great. Goldwater was a man's man. He was um, he was a difficult man in many ways, but he made a huge contribution to American conservatism. Lee Edwards is known as the historian of the conservative movement. It's certainly appropriate 
that he should have written the um, biography of Barry Goldwater because he's such a big part of that movement. So Lee, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you and um, Lee will talk and answer questions afterward. Gee, I enjoyed that so much. I just sort of sitting here and it, oh, all of a sudden, oh, I got to get up and say something. Oh my goodness. No, can't do that. Put that right there. Love that cover. Love that cover. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. Great day to be alive and to talk about Barry Goldwater. He was, to sum it up, he was the most consequential loser in American politics ever. He sparked a revolution. He ignited it with his 1964 run for the presidency, but he was a most unlikely revolutionary, a consider. College dropout, one year at the University of Arizona in Tucson, then left to help run the family business because his father died unexpectedly. But yet, his 1960 political manifesto, which Alice made reference to, the conscience of a conservative, sold 3.5, maybe 4 million copies. And it was once required reading for History 169B at Harvard. Now his little book does not pretend to be a deep philosophical treatise. It's light years from Eric Vogelin or Leo Strauss. It is, in fact, a primer on conservatism. We call it uh, Conservatism 101. But it was precisely what was needed by an emerging political movement. Not quite sure what it was or where it was going. So Goldwater not only defined conservatism for the people, but he outlined a political agenda. But what is in conscience of a conservative? And for those of you who have not read it, it's only 120 pages, as Al said. Probably could read it in maybe an hour, something like that. But it still holds up marvelously well. It argues that America is fundamentally a conservative nation and that the American people yearn for a return to conservative principles. And it dismisses the liberal notion and argument that conservatism is out of date. He said, well, that's like saying that the golden rule or the Ten Commandments or Aristotle's politics are out of date. The conservative approach, Goldwater says, is, quote, nothing more or less than an attempt to apply the wisdom and experience and the revealed truths of the past to the problems of today. Now, conscience is not a list of public policy recommendations fated to soon fade away. Why? Because it describes the philosophy undergirding the recommendations, which is why many, if not most, of those recommendations are as relevant today as they were 55 years ago when they were first suggested by the author. Unlike the liberal, Goldwater says, the conservative believes that man is not only an economic creature, but a spiritual creature who, quote, looks upon the enhancement of man's spiritual nature as the primary concern of political philosophy. And summing up the conservative philosophy, Goldwater says, that politics is what? The art of maximizing and achieving the maximum amount of freedom for individuals that is, in, that is consistent with the maintenance of social order. Another way of putting it is that the conservative goal is ordered liberty. But tragically, Goldwater says, the balance between freedom and order has tipped against freedom practically everywhere on earth. And so the day's overriding political challenge is to preserve and extend freedom. Notice, he says, extend, not just preserve freedom. 
Freedom is in peril in America, he warns, because leaders and members of both political parties have ignored and misinterpreted the most important document in American government, the Constitution. Sound familiar? The result, he says, is a leviathan, a vast national authority out of touch with the people and out of their control. Just four years after he wrote those riveting words, Barry Goldwater declared his presidential candidacy, promising to bring Leviathan under control and to restore freedom to its rightful place at the center of the American dream. It was the fusionist thought of the conscience of a conservative, both libertarian and conservative, and the daring thrust of his presidential campaign a rare combination of the philosophical and the political that fix Goldwater in the heart and the mind of conservatives and attracted millions of Americans. Now, as Al said, uh, he wasn't perfect. <laughs> uh, he was a man of contradictions, in inspiring, yes, but also infuriating. He said of his presidential race, I know I'm going to lose, but I'm going to lose it my way based upon conservative principles, of course. He was courageous and cantankerous, saying, I didn't come to Washington to pass laws, but to repeal them. He was profane and also profound. One of his favorite axioms, and now you've heard this, but Goldwater said it first, any government big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. He delighted in saying the unexpected, like the famous line from his acceptance speech, quote, extremism and the defense of liberty is no vice. And he was vilified and condemned for saying it. But let's consider, was Patrick Henry an extremist because he declared, give me liberty or give me death? Were the Americans who fought and died in World War II to defeat Nazism and Imperial Japan extremists? Was Christ an extremist because he died on the cross? More to the point for the purposes of our discussion this afternoon, was Martin Luther King Jr. guilty of extremism when he wrote from Birmingham jail just the previous year, quote, the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. So yes, Barry Goldwater was an extremist, an extremist for liberty and against tyranny. And he constantly challenged conventional wisdom, asking, well, why can't we have a voluntary option for our social security system, which is headed for bankruptcy? He argued that welfare, quote, ought to be a private concern promoted by individuals and families, churches, private hospitals, religious service organizations, community charities, and other institutions. He demonstrated his own personal compassion by flying food and medicine to snowbound Navajos in his private plane and without asking for the government's permission to do so. The Constitution was his guide. The Declaration of Independence his inspiration. In an address to the American Political Science Association in September of 1964, an address grievously unreported by the media, Goldwater praised the founders for creating the American system of federalism with its genius for combining, quote, the size and power of a great empire with the freedom of a small republic. He had a good sense of humor about himself. He was the son of a Jewish father and a Protestant mother, and he once approached the first tee of the Phoenix Golf and Country Club, but was stopped by an official who said, we don't allow Jews to play here. Well, replied Goldwater, I'm only half Jewish. Can I play nine holes? <laughs> Uh, he affected American politics more than any other losing presidential candidate in modern times. He dared to raise third rail issues like 
Social Security, farm subsidies, welfare reform, privatization of government property, and victory, a victory over communism. He inspired thousands of young people to get into and stay in politics and public policy. Among them, and listen to this list, among them were Ed Fulner, president of the Heritage Foundation, Ed Crane, president of the Cato Institute. As a matter of fact, Crane was the head of Students for Goldwater at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. A presidential candidate and commentator, Pat Buchanan, direct mail guru, Richard Vigory, Morton Blackwell, head of the Leadership Institute, publisher, Al Regnery, Randy T., chairman of the Fund for American Studies, David Keene, former chairman of the American Conservative Union and the National Rifle Association, and Ron Robinson, president of Young America's Foundation. What a lineup of outstanding conservative leaders, all inspired by Barry Goldwater. Some of the politicians who raised the conservative torch because of him included Congressman Phil Crane of Illinois, Bill Brock of Tennessee, Bob Bauman of Maryland, James Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin, Duncan Hunter of California, Senator James Buckley of New York, and Governor Paul Laxalt of Nevada. He was the first presidential candidate to use direct mail and television in national political fundraising. Over one million individuals contributed to the 1964 Goldwater campaign, one million. In 1960, when Richard Nixon ran, he got contributions from some 40,000 donors. The Goldwater campaign prepared the way in the following decades for conservative candidates and institutions like, like Heritage to use direct mail to raise money and communicate ideas to a national audience. Perhaps more important than almost anything else, by winning Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Louisiana, Goldwater broke the Democrats' iron grip on the solid South, enabling the GOP to become a national party. He persuaded 27.5 million Americans to vote conservative despite an unprecedented anti-campaign at Anti should have a capital A and a capital C, was run by President Lyndon Johnson out of the White House. As a matter of fact, they met right under the Oval Office. The White House's dirty tricks included having the FBI bug Goldwater's campaign plan and the CIA to plant a spy in Goldwater's national headquarters. Now, neither one of those organizations should do something like that unless the person they were bugging and planting spies in was a national security risk. Well, that was not Barry Goldwater. The business about the FBI bugging it, I uncovered in, in my book, and it came from Robert Mardian, who in 1970 was appointed to go to work for the Department of Justice, and he had a meeting with the director, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, and they were talking about a number of things, including national security, because Bob was going to be taking on that thing. And 1964 came up, and Mardian said, well, Mr. Director, I heard something about uh, wiretaps and so forth. Did the FBI wiretap bug Barry Goldwater's campaign? And Hoover said, yes. And Mardian said, why? And Hoover responded, you do what the president tells you to do. <laughs> Barry Goldwater also personally approved Ronald Reagan's famous TV talk, A Time for Choosing. I think probably most of us have seen it or heard it or enjoyed it. And we know what, what an impact it had. But it was a speech which Goldwater's advisors tried to kill twice right up to the evening that it was broadcast. So they said, well, uh, we've got to get this thing resolved. We're going to have to get Goldwater himself involved in it. And he had not heard or seen the, um, the show, the program. 
And so they set up a, a hearing because they, they couldn't get a hold of a, of a film, so they just played the audio. And they played it, Ronald Reagan's A Time for Choosing, first time Goldwater had ever uh, heard it. And he finished listening, he said, what the hell's wrong with that? <laughs> Run it. And they did, and it made political history. Because following that, prominent Republicans came to Reagan in early 1965 and begged him to run for governor of California. One can say in political shorthand, no presidential candidate Goldwater, no President Ronald Reagan. Well, who was Barry Goldwater? He said about himself, well, I'd like to be remembered as an honest man who did his best. He was a patriot, loved his country, he was willing to risk his life for it in war, flying supplies over the treacherous Himalayas to our free China allies during World War II. And he continued to give his life for his country in peace. In 1964, he went through the crucible of crushing defeat. Uh, Lyndon Johnson won in the landslide, uh, winning 61% of the popular vote, some 44 uh, states. But with all of the terrible personal attacks which were visited upon him as somebody who would destroy Social Security or would get us into a nuclear war, uh, who didn't like blacks, and we can get into that in the, uh, in the Q&A, I hope we will, never a single word of public complaint. Even when a muckraking magazine published a cover story trumpeting, quote, the title, 1,189 Psychiatrists Say Goldwater is Psychologically Unfit to be President. Didn't say anything about that. But he later sued and won a judgment against the publisher and the magazine that was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. He was a prophet, an Old Testament Jeremiah, who sternly warned the people to repent of their wasteful ways or reap a whirlwind of debt and deficits. He was a pioneer who led the Republican Party out of the barren east and into a verdant south and west where victory awaited them. He was, in George Will's words, a man who lost 44 states but won the future. He was, as I say, the most consequential loser in modern presidential politics. He promised a choice, not an echo. He gave the American people the opportunity to choose between a party that emphasized individual liberty and a party that favored the extension of government power. He wasn't so much the candidate of a political party, but the personification of a political movement. The political historian Theodore White wrote of Goldwater that, quote, again and again in American history it's happened that the losers of the presidency contributed almost as much to the permanent tone and dialogue of politics as did the winners. Barry Goldwater's presidential candidacy, I think, marked the beginning of a tectonic shift in American politics from east to west, from the cities to the suburbs, from big government to limited government, from containment to liberation, from liberal to conservative, that continues to shape the politics of our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. I've always been impressed by, as the first questioner, I'll take that prerogative, the senator's resilience. He, like Ronald Reagan, seemed to have a personal resilience. I know that one attack was questioned of him one time, and his only answer was, I don't get into smelling contests with skunks. <laughs> what, what do you see in his personality that allowed him, regardless of saying he knew he was going to lose that election, still to lose it in the way he lost it and the personal demagoguery that went against him, he seemed not to be phased in a lot of ways by it. Was he? Was he not? 
and do you have any key to why he was so resilient? Well, certainly privately he was uh, he was angry. You know, yeah. That lousy rotten sons of bitches, you know. <laughs> you know, so he would say that privately. Okay, we finally got the true cold water out. Right, right, right. right. Uh, but not publicly. And that you know, he was not a whiner. He was not a complainer. He just kept going and his traveling press secretary Vic Gold said, "Well, Senator, just how how can you possibly keep uh, keep so calm and with all these things going on he said he said Vic he said politics is like a bullfight and sometimes you get gored and you just pick yourself up and keep fighting uh, he, he was uh, somebody as you say who was resilient and I think also what would motivate him was that he really saw the campaign as an opportunity to present conservative ideas conservative beliefs, conservative solutions. And that really kept him going uh, when I think almost anybody else would have, would have given up. Just think about this. In January of 1964, uh, when, the, when the campaign effectively started, when he announced it, uh, he took some polls. I, I worked in the campaign, so uh, I was there. We took a poll, and it showed Lyndon Baines Johnson, and this was January, Two months, just two months after Kennedy's assassination for you younger guys, uh, that was in November of 63, so this is two months later, and it showed Lyndon Johnson, the, the president, the former vice president who became, succeeded, became president, getting 75% of the vote, 75%. Every other Republican got 25 or less, including, including Barry Goldwater. So we knew, he knew, going into it, that his chances of victory were, were, were effectively nil. Why? Because the American people wanted Lyndon Johnson, the new president, to carry out the program of the martyred John Kennedy. And that was a tremendous advantage, and, and Johnson uh, used it effectively. We'll have, take questions. I'll start back here on this corner. Al and Lee will be glad to interject at any time. So you say that um, Goldwater had the right ideas, but he lost. And um, I think arguably we have the right ideas and very good, strong, clear ideas today, but we continue to lose. I mean, government since 1960 is ever more intrusive and ever more extensive. And so we seem to be winning ideas but losing the battles. What, what's the problem? <laughs> Simple <laughs> question. Yeah. Answer that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Al? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, certainly in 1964, the American people were not ready for conservative ideas, and we knew that. We knew that. I mean, it, you know, there was a quite a fair amount of prosperity going on at that time. Uh, we were not at war. People were not yet fighting in Vietnam. Uh, Johnson lied about that, among many other things that he lied about. He said that I will not send American boys to fight in an Asian war. And when he said that in the campaign of 1964, he was already planning with the Pentagon to send a couple hundred thousand men, American men, to fight in that Asian war. Uh, but the American people uh, were not, not ready for a lot of what Barry Goldwater was talking about. Subsequently, uh, many of the ideas which he advanced, for example, doing something about Social Security. Now, it's true uh, up and down on that, but people are now willing to discuss it, which they weren't back in 1960. No, no, no don't even want to get into that. Uh, his contribution in the area of foreign policy, of peace through strength, of talking about winning the Cold War, not just playing for a tie, not just talking about detente and accommodation, that prevailed. Uh, Ronald Reagan said that he borrowed many of his ideas from, from, from Barry Goldwater. Uh, why that doesn't happen today, uh, there are many, many ideas. I'll just say this, that when you have a $4 trillion annual budget, um, it's very difficult to be able to draw back and say now, gee, can I get a little piece of that for this part of my constituency? Is that going to help me when I get reelected to Congress or the Senate? Government has become so large that it's going to be even more and more difficult. But yet there's still hopeful signs, the Tea Party victory, 
Um, and I think the fact that uh, there are a lot of people talking conservative ideas, you know, one of the things that uh, has happened, people should take encouragement from, 1964, Barry Goldwater was the only conservative candidate, the only one. In the Republican Party, he was running against Nelson Rockefeller, George Romney, uh, Bill Scranton, Cabot Lodge. Every one of them was a liberal. Every one of them. He was the only conservative. Today, you know, you, you can't can't find there isn't there isn't a single liberal candidate. So I think there is some progress there, but it's not going to be easy, and uh, it's going to take time and patience, uh, and maybe. Uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Go ahead, Al, please. Yeah, um, let me just add a couple of things to that. Um, in 1964, there was no conservative movement. There were a few people that were writing books. There were a few politicians like Goldwater, a few senators, a couple of governors who were speaking about those things. But there were no Heritage Foundations, Cato Institutes. Um, there were a few organizations. AEI was there. but. Um, as we know it today, Goldwater did not have an army to go out and campaign for him. It was all people that were that had those ideas, but that were just that were unorganized. And um, that all changed partially because of what, as Lee said, because of what Goldwater did. Um, the other thing, Milton, that I would point out is that don't forget that if you look at current politics, and that I know is not the topic today, but um, since Obama was elected, there are a thousand fewer Democrats in office across the country than there were then. They've lost basically every election except the two presidential elections. You look at the two parties, the two principal candidates in the Democratic Party are 69 and 73 years old. They're over the hill, and the Republicans are in their 40s, early 50s. There are, there, the Democrats simply don't have a bench, and that's because of all those thousand <clears throat> people that were defeated who were their bench who are now back practicing law or whatever they were doing. So. Um, nothing is constant, and things change quickly. Um, you look at the, the Soviet Union, and it was all vibrant and going along fine, and all of a sudden it wasn't there anymore. So um, if you look back at history, you'll find that, that things evolve, and it may look grim right now, but as opposed to what conservatives saw in 1948, 1952, 1960, it looks pretty bright. I would just add this about about the the campaign and talking about workers. So, uh, there were no organ there was no organized movement, as Al says, and we didn't have uh, the AFL CIO pro providing <laughs> troops as they did for the Democrats in those days. But the appeal of Goldwater, as I say, both as the will as sort of the the philosopher, com common man philosopher with the conscience of a conservative, and as a candidate, was so inspiring to so many people that in California, it was a key primary in June of 1964, and probably we had to win that to get the nomination. There's some, some debate about that, but certainly the, the senator, Goldwater, felt that he ought to be able to win one large populous state. How did we win it? Well, there were t among the things which helped us to win it were 50,000 volunteers. Now just think, oh, 50,000 people volunteered to work for Barry Goldwater in that primary. Um, the campaign manager uh, for, for Nelson Rockefeller, who was the, our big opponent out there, said, he said, oh, the, you guys kept coming at me like the Chinese army, you know, <laughs> just, you know, battalion and after battalion, <laughs> army after army. So, and the other thing was uh, a little book called A Choice uh, not an echo by Phyllis Schlafly, who does a foreword in uh, in my book. It was a new foreword. Uh, this little book of hers, a couple hundred pages also, um, we passed out 50,000 copies of it in just one state in one month. Uh, and uh, wherever we did that, we found out that we gained more votes than we lost. So it proves, uh, it proves the, the importance of little paperbacks uh, it was sort of the social media uh, of the day, the, the Twitter of the day, if you will. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you talk about California. Um, it often depends how things are said as opposed to what is said. Um, <laughs> Goldwater certainly opened the door, but he lost California by a million votes. 
two years in, later, in the general election. Yeah, yeah, in, in, general, in general election. We lost yeah. California yeah. by a million. But votes. we won the we won the primary. Right. Yeah. But in the general election, <laughs> by fifty thousand. Boy, I tell you, we had a big margin. <laughs> right. But then against Lyndon Johnson, a million votes. Yes. Two years later, Ronald Reagan ran for governor. Yep. On essentially the same platform that Goldwater ran on. Of course, it was state issues rather than national issues. He won California by a million votes. Just a, two years, so things do change. We have a question over on the left side. Hi, Doug Brooks. Uh, used to work for the Democratic Party, more of a libertarian these days. My question would be on uh, on Goldwater in today's uh, Republican primaries. I mean, Goldwater is uh, very much of a libertarian. He was he had enlightened views on gays. Uh, he was very much against having the the fundamentalist Christian uh, movement involved uh, in the party. Um, would he have a prayer of winning the Republican primary today? Well, you have to keep in mind there, there are two Goldwaters. There was <laughs> the Goldwater of 1960 through 1964. Um, in The Conscience of a Conservative, as I, as I indicated, he very clearly talked about the spiritual side of man. Uh, he uh, made it very clear uh, that he was both a libertarian and a conservative. Uh, there were the social issues uh, were not that important in, uh, in 1964. Uh, uh, we, we began every, every rally with a prayer. Um, there were always, there was always a chaplain around, there was always a minister around, there was always a pastor around. He was very comfortable with with organized religion. He was a somebody who, as a young man, had been an acolyte in the Episcopalian Church in Phoenix. Um, so he was not anti-religion anti or anti-church. Um, with regard to the social issues, let's take, take abortion, for example. Might as, well, might as well get into it, for you guys might be interested. Uh, he was pro-life uh, through all of his Senate terms and only shifted after he had won his last race in, 19, in 1980. Uh, his uh, legislative assistant, Terry uh, Richardson, uh, said, uh, told me when I interviewed him, he, he said, we had this debate for seven years about abortion. Uh, and the senator kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally, uh, he finally said to Terry, he said, I'm sorry, I just cannot believe that that, that is, a, is a, a child, is a human being. And so he shifted. But through most of his political career, he was pro-life. With regard to, to gay rights, he said two things. One, when he was asked about gays in the military, he said, well, you don't have to, to be straight to shoot straight, which I think is one of the great lines, you know, of... Uh, of political uh, rhetoric. Um, so that, on the other hand, he introduced legislation pro-family, which was not explicitly anti-gay or homosexual, which was the word which was used back in those days, but was uh, certainly there. And then after he left the Senate, many, 10 years after he left the Senate, his grandson came to him and said, Grandpa, I'm gay. Oh, well, like like all of us, you know, we tend to personalize issues, and that did that did change his his mind a little bit about about gay rights. But uh, on national defense, he was always strong for national defense, always for limited government, always for free enterprise. So he was really a a traditional conservative most of the time. How we do today? Um, well. All I can say is this, that, that, that several of the candidates today, it seems to me, are, are sounding uh, like him in, in the terms of being very candid, very straightforward, very black and white. This is what I believe. This is what I'm going to stand for. And you can sort of guess whom I'm talking about. It's more than just one, by the way, more than mm -hmm. just one. And so I think there's, the, although most of them say, uh, quote, Reagan all the time, I think there's a lot of Barry Goldwater in, in several of them as well. Another question down here in front. I think uh, many people are familiar with the story of Goldwater versus Johnson in the mm. general election. 
those are my first memories. I remember going with my dad to vote <laughs> in 64. But what I found really interesting in your book, in particular, was the story of Goldwater's fight for the nomination. And that was, that was all pretty new to me. How would you referred to this a minute ago, but how would you assess Goldwater's legacy in terms of the Republican Party? Um, and was, you know, th the race in 1964 was very different than anything we've had since, I think. There's no Rockefeller, Scranton, and so forth. Was that because of Goldwater? Or was, is that just the way uh, things shifted out between the parties over time? Well, I think you can say that 1964 was the, was the beginning of the process of where the Republican Party became the conservative party, without any question that happened. Uh, not only did uh, Goldwater win the nomination, but state chairman and county chairman and a whole bunch of people at the organizational level were conservative and stayed uh, very, very strong and powerful in running the affairs of the party. Um, his most significant contribution, I think, in, politically, uh, in a sense, in 1964, was winning the Deep South and breaking the Democratic hold on it, which they had had for, for you know, decades, back since, uh, not since Hoover or Coolidge, for that matter. So that was a, a significant contribution. Nixon uh, always knew where the power was. And in 1968, when he ran, uh, he made sure that he hired a whole bunch of Goldwater people to run his campaign and to advise him on the issues. And that helped him to win that uh, nomination in 1968 over Nelson Rockefeller and over Ronald Reagan. You might have something yeah, on that too. Yeah, well. remember that in those days, the parties were much closer together philosophically than they are now. I mean, the, the Southern Democrats were largely, on most issues, very conservative. Um, the, uh, even the, the national parties differed to some extent, but they crossed over a lot. Um, Kennedy, for example, if you look back at the, at the way he, the, he ruled, basically it wasn't particularly liberal. Lyndon Johnson had been a segregationist before he was president. And also, Lyndon Johnson, remember when he was the vice president um, under Kennedy, he was persona non grata in Washington. Uh -huh. his, his ratings were in the toilet. I mean, if he got 20% approval rating, I'd be surprised. Even the Washington Post was talking about dumping him as vice president, bringing in a different vice president before Kennedy was shot. So, of course, he, he pulled it together after, after the assassination. But um, they were, there were, even when I worked in the Senate in 1978, um, the re there were... Democrats that were as conservative as many Republicans and Republicans who were as liberal as many Democrats. So that's all changed. So you have this um, distinction now that is, and I think the Democrats are much more liberal as a party than they used to be. Uh, Republicans are much more conservative. Maybe that's the reason why. But So 1964 was a very different exercise than it is now. And if Barry Goldwater were running now, presumably he wouldn't be running as he ran exactly in 1964. I mean, obviously... He recognized what the issues were and adapted himself to some extent to those. I think he would he would talk about social security reform. He would talk about doing away with farm subsidies. He would talk about victory over terrorism. Uh, you know, I think he probably would come up with a couple of issues which would be very appropriate and very pertinent uh, for for today's politics. And as a matter of fact, the conscience of conservative, if you read it, it's much of it is still the same. Yes. I mean, the arguments right. obviously the numbers are different, and there are some things that that are different, but there's a lot of it that is, um, the, the issues are no different than they were then. And can be applied to the politics of today. So well, to young Al's guys get out there and read that book. And to Al's point, and Lee can con comment too, I thought your question might be going to the thing that I found fascinating in history, was that go the two parties at one point, at least Kennedy and Goldwater, were speaking to each other to the degree <laughs> of they thought they would take a joint flight, joint travel, joint campaign in some issues around the country, did they not, in 64? Well, yes. Uh, there, there was discussion. Just to go back, and you're absolutely right, uh, Jack Kennedy and Barry Goldwater were, were friends because they both served in the U.S. Senate throughout the 1950s, uh, and they liked each other, and they, they, made, they, they made fun of each other. 
and and they shared each other's black book. No, 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 I didn't know. No, no, strike that. This is off the record, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, after uh, the Bay of Pigs uh, fiasco uh, in 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 uh, spring of 1961, where Kennedy. Uh, bollocked up the uh, the operation. Uh, Goldwater called on Kennedy and was was commiserating with him, and but then shoot him out for saying, "Why did you pull back on the air and sea support? Because if you had done that, it might have been a successful operation." So they they were friends. And so in 1964, I, I I tried to pin down who first broached the idea. I rather suspect that it was it was Goldwater, but I was never quite able to to make clear about that. They said. Goldwater said to Kennedy, why don't we travel around the country in the same plane mm -hmm. and go from city to city, and in one we'll talk about Social Security, and we'll talk about communism, and we'll talk about balanced budgets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't that be terrific? And Kennedy said, oh, it's an interesting idea. When I, and when I interviewed Ted Sorensen, he said, well, yes, there, there was a little talk about it, but we, we were not locked in on that. But uh, wouldn't that have been great if those two men? And the, the idea was, of course, the, the uh, Douglas-Lincoln uh, debates of uh, 1858, when those two men were competing uh, against each other, not for the presidency, by the way, but for the U.S. Senate. To heck, repeat that all those years later would have been great. Other questions? Time for a couple back in the corner. I'm very curious. Uh, you said Goldwater's staff rejected Reagan's 1964 speech twice. Yes. I personally love that speech. What were their arguments? <laughs> <laughs> well, damn it, the, our candidate is Barry Goldwater, not Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Why the hell should we run a half hour of Ronald Reagan? Exactly. It's, it's not a you know uh, you know a, 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 a an unreasonable question on, on their part. Um, but what they were more concerned about, because a lot of people were saying a lot of things about, about Barry Goldwater, some of them were on radio, some were on television, uh, whether it was a, a John Wayne or whatever, whatever like that, is that if you read A Time for Choosing or listen to it or watch it again, you'll see he talks about Social Security. He talks about farm subsidies. He talks about, you know, a, a very strong, aggressive foreign policy. And those were issues which had hurt uh, the senator early in the year. And so they wanted not to have them, you know, raised again in the last week of the campaign. But in, in point of fact, nobody went around commenting after they'd seen a time for choosing and said, oh, that was terrible what he said because it raised all of these uh, in, inflammatory issues. Um, it, it came down to the fact that with about just a couple of hours to the showing, the airing of the, of the show, uh, Bill Baruti was still trying to kill it. He was uh, the unofficial campaign manager. He was still trying to kill it. And he got on the phone with the gentleman who was chairman of TV for Goldwater Miller out in California gentleman named Walter Knott, the Knott's Berry Farm. Any of you guys ever been to California? And, 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 and Broody said, now, you know, Walter, uh, you know, this is a little controversial. We really, we want to run it. So Mr. Knott, a very polite gentleman, said, what do you want to run? Well, we got this thing called Brunch with Berry. Well, what's the, well, it's the, uh, Berry's talking with five women about, about uh, pocketbook issues. <sighs> Uh, oh, what? Oh, no, no, no. Well, what else you got? Well, we want to, to run maybe a conversation at Gettysburg. Uh, the senator and Dwight uh, General Eisenhower had done a half-hour show, which is not a bad show, uh, but it, it is not had, It's painful, but not uh, a bad show. Right, right, right. Well, the, 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 the most, most of the pain was expressed on the face of Dwight David yeah. Eisenhower. <laughs> yes. How do, how do they get me to do this? And so, so Walter finally, not funny, said, well, tell you what, Bill. You go out and raise the $125,000, and you can put on whatever show you want. We have got it. We've already, we have the money in hand. We've given it to the network, and we're going to run a time for choosing. 
It's this long pause. And then Mr. Brody said, uh, okay, okay, and, and hung up. So that was, you know, political history was made over the, the strenuous objections of the, of the Go Water campaign management, but, but not the senator, not the senator. He had, the, he had the, the good judgment to realize just what a terrific speech this was. And in fact, apparently a good many Republicans after the speech said, did we nominate the wrong guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some of that too. Do we still have another question over on that side? Hi, thanks for speaking. Um, I love conscience of a conservative, and I talk to people about it, and some good conservatives, they say, I like it all except the civil rights chapter. Mm -hmm. And I've, like, I've interpreted his defense of um, being against like the federal mandate to integrate schools as just um, a constitutional 14th Amendment state powers thing. But it seems like it gets harder and harder to defend a man mm -hmm. who would take that stance mm -hmm. when I'm trying to spread the conservative message. Right. So I was wondering if you could right. give some insight and background that right. could help strengthen right. that argument. Um, with regard to Brown versus the Board of Education, which is the section in conscience uh, which you're referring to, uh, he said it was unconstitutional and that uh, education was a local issue, a local matter, a local responsibility, and the federal government should not be involved in it all. That's what he wrote in the conscience of a conservative. He changed his mind. He said, uh, I, I'm, I, w I was wrong, um, uh, that uh, I can see that there can be a role uh, for, the, uh, for the federal government. And when, in point of fact, uh, three years later, uh, when uh, Eisenhower, I remember 1957, uh, sent in the 82nd Airborne, I think it was, to make sure that those kids, black kids, were able to go to the school in Little Rock, uh, Goldwater later said, that uh, he could understand that that was necessary at that time. With regard to civil rights, and this could take uh, a little bit of time, but let me just put it to you this way. He voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, based upon two titles, Title II and Title VII. Title II dealing with public accommodations, Title VII uh, dealing with the question of employment. And he's predicted that Title II, with regard to public accommodations, might require, and would require, rather, a police force to enforce it. Well, he was wrong about that, and, and so that did not come to, to pass. But with regard to employment, he said that this will bring about affirmative action. This will bring about quotas. This will bring about employers being forced and required by the government to hire certain people. And that was denied by the floor managers of that bill on the floor by Senator Hubert Humphrey, who even went so far as to say, I will eat my hat, Senator, if that comes to pass. Well, of course, it did come to pass. Affirmative action within just a couple of years, as we know, in hiring quotas and all the rest of it. So he was doing it on, on constitutional grounds. But um, this was 1964. Uh, Mississippi was burning. Uh, freedom fighters were being murdered uh, in Mississippi and, th and other places in the Deep South. And blacks were saying, well, how much longer do we have to wait for Jim Crow to be buried? How much longer are you going to say that the states are going to take care of this issue? And so, although he stood on constitutional principles, I think it can be argued that morally he was wrong, that there was a need to address this very grievous denial of the rights of, uh, of blacks and African Americans, which had been going on for a century and which was uh, changed with the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1964. Let me we'll say one more thing. 1965, he was not in the Senate. Uh, it was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I asked him, would you have voted for the Voting Rights Act of 1965? He said yes. Why? I said, well, it's a constitutional. Uh, I can see that as, as being, you would have to, under the Constitution, protect the rights. If people are being denied the right to vote, there is a role for the federal government there. But he would not. I said, well, what about the Civil Rights? He said, no, no, I was still right about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But 
uh, conservatives and Republicans have had to pay a pretty pretty stiff price for that over the years. We've been uh, accused of being, you know, bigots and segregationists and all the rest of it. So it, that still is is a heavy price to pay. Although when Goldwater was in the city council in Phoenix, he was a big proponent oh, yeah. of integration. In fact, I think he integrated the the Arizona National Guard um, single handedly. So he was certainly on the right side of things before he was in the Senate. Well, yeah, and as well. These weren't constitutional issues at that time. They right, were local yeah. issues. Yeah. This was consistent with his idea of, of local action to solve problems like this. Uh, desegregated the, uh, the Air National Guard. He was a supporter of the NAACP in Phoenix. He was a supporter of the Urban League. He paid their rent for two years. Uh, and he desegregated the Senate dining facilities in 1953. His legislative assistant was black. It was an African-American from Tucson, a woman, as a matter of fact. And uh, she was denied her first day in there going down to the, to the cafeteria, which is used by uh, members of the Senate and staff and so forth, denied service. They said, oh, no, what are you doing? You know, go, go in the back. We'll give you something. No, no. She went back upstairs, told Goldwater about this. He blew up, just absolutely exploded got on the phone, blistering telephone call to the appropriate senator and said, you will serve and make sure that my assistant and anybody else of color is served or I will call a press conference and I will burn your ass from here to Phoenix. <laughs> and so the next day she went down and she was served. So that was how the, the, def, the cafeteria dining facilities of the Senate were desegregated by this freshman senator from, from Arizona. We have a final question from the audience. All the way back, if you'll wait for the mic. Thank you. What was uh, Goldwater's role in the writing of The Conscience of the Conservative? Uh, Dean Clarence Mannion thought it would be a good idea to have some little primer on Americanism. Uh, and they went to Brent Bozell, uh, who was the, uh, the brother-in-law of Bill Buckley, uh, who had been a speechwriter for Joe McCarthy and had been a speechwriter for Barry Goldwater for a number of years. And they said, well, why don't you write it since you know the senator, you work with him? And he said, fine. And he went to the senator and the senator said, that's fine, sure, I'll be happy to do that. And so over about a period of something like four to five months, uh, Brent would draft the chapter, would then go up uh, to the Senate, show it to the senator, who would go through and say, it looks pretty good, and come back again a couple of weeks later with another chapter, another chapter, another chapter. If you, if you read The Conscience, there are several of chapters are clearly taken from speeches that he made, positions that he took on things like labor and, uh, and other things, and particularly on the one-third of the book, which is about foreign policy and anti-communism. That's very clearly something he'd said many, many times before. The philosophy up front is Brent Bozell, uh, some of the, the wonderful language there. But it was a collaborative effort between the two men. It, it's sometimes said that Barry Goward had nothing to do with it. That's just not true. Because I talked with Brent Bozell. He described for me the process. I talked with the senator's assistants, and they remembered Brent coming up and talking with the senator over a period of several months about it. It was a true collaboration between speechwriter and uh, and the principal as well. And it's a heck of a book, and I really encourage it. It's almost as good as my Goldwater biography. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you guys uh, want to buy it, or are, we, are we selling it? Or? We're selling it, and we'll have you sign any copies here I'd inside. Be, I'd be happy to do uh, that. Too. And reporting out, as Al mentioned in the beginning, only a little research. I believe you interviewed 167 or some odd number of people personally for the book originally, and also went through all of the senator's personal files. So there's no little research done in this book. Uh, we're pleased that Phyllis Schlafly could add the new preface and have this update, and in a year that we're facing a rare, rare uh, campaign with all the conservatives, we're glad to have someone who can show us the way. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you, Lee, and thank you all.